Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this late afternoon on what I believe is the last technical session of the day. Um, my name is Roger Barge. I'm general manager for AWS Robotics, and I'm extremely pleased to be joined today by Christopher Morgan of Toyota Advanced Logistics. Christopher brings a long history and experience of building, deploying, and operating robots in production, as well as working at the cutting edge of R&D for robotics. So I'm pleased to have him here with us today to, to share this stage with me. We're here to talk about robotics. We might as well start with what do we define as a robot? We look at this very general. A robot is something that can sense its environment through sensors. It can make computation on the data coming off those sensors, and it can take action. And if you follow this space like I do, there are numerous examples of robots being innovated on, soft body robots, crawling robots. But if you look at the industrial applications of them, we really see three main form factors. Drones, robotic arms, and ground mobility. And we view all these in scope for what we will be able to support with AWS RoboMaker. AWS RoboMaker is a service that we launched last year here at reInvent, actually at Midnight Madness, so last year at this time. Um, and as we positioned it, it was, a, it was a service that allowed developers to build their robots, to deploy their applications to robots, and for operators to then manage the, these robots once they were put in production. And so I'd certainly like to provide a refresher for those of you who have heard about the service or, or don't. I'd like to talk to you about three main elements of it, but do so through the experience of customers that we have worked with this year that are actually using the service. So there's three areas that I'll highlight, and there's actually more under the covers, but I'll just focus on these three. Cloud extensions for robots that actually enable a, a robot to take advantage of computing and storage and analytics in the cloud in a very seamless manner. Second is simulation, and I'll explain more of the, the role of simulation in robotics. And third is fleet management. Again, think about the operator that has to operate hundreds or thousands of robots and update them with software, debug them, and monitor them. That's fleet management. Let's look at each one of these and then how customers have used it this year. The first are our cloud extensions for robotics. You know, the reality, roboticists have to deal with a lot, hardware, firmware, programming of the robot. The last thing they need to have to learn how to do is to how to use a cloud or the cloud service. So we've actually packaged up integrations, software that can actually run on the robot that attaches them back securely to AWS services. So with a simple API call, or if you're a robotics developer, you know ROS topics and ROS packages. So it, the software runs on the robot, but it makes a secure connection back to the cloud so it can be augmented by, this, by, by the functionality of a cloud. And what we've started with, just to get started, Amazon, Lex, and Polly, so people can talk to the robot. It can in return respond back to them. Kinesis video streams, so that LiDAR, radar, and video can stream off of a robot. Of course, be processed in the cloud by recognition so the robot can recognize what it's seeing. And turns out one of the most useful ones, CloudWatch. You can get the log records off a robot in production. You can get the metrics, GPS coordinates, power level. You can actually monitor your remote robot remotely and set up a dashboard. Let me tell you about one of my customers and what they've done with it. Leah is a walker robot. Um, it has 72 sensors mostly for safety and security of the patient that's walking on the robot, and it's for the elderly and disabled. Very low-end CPU, so you're not gonna try to push a lot of high-end processing down to LIA, but we were able to attach our cloud extensions. When we worked with the customer, what they wanted is they wanted to add a more natural voice interaction to LIA, so the, the, the customer could talk to LIA. LIA could respond and give verbal encouragement back. They wanted real-time monitoring. Was the patient moving? How active were they? They wanted to do live video streaming so that Leah could actually stream video back to a monitor, a doctor, a caregiver, a loved one. And similarly, the video could be streamed back to Leah as well. But the team had very little exper expertise in AWS cloud services. There's very limited compute power on that device. And they had the team had very limited engineering resources. This is a group that picked up our cloud extensions. And this picture, we always like to show these architecture diagrams. What you're seeing on the left-hand side is the actual robot. That little icon at the top is our robot. Um, the ROS extensions are those cloud extensions I talked about, the software that runs on the robot that makes a secure connection back to the cloud. In this case, they chose Amazon Lex, Amazon Poly for the verbal interactions, 
Amazon recognition to process what the, what the robot was seeing through video. In the middle, you actually see any time a developer wants to actually update the robot, the robot's connected to the, to the customer's internet um, wireless, and so they can actually push software updates. So as the team is evol evolving um, Leah, they can actually push software updates and keep her updated with new features. And at the very bottom, we're actually streaming NQT data about the customers, how active were they, how many steps did they take, were there any events detected on the device, so they can actually monitor the patient and even the device itself. So they actually built the voice interface within hours. They'd had live monitoring and alerting up and running within days, and the live video streaming I mean, they had running within days as well. Now, if you think about what that means for small companies to actually add this kind of capability without taxing the hardware, adding a more a lot of cost to the robot, just making secure API calls, this is what excites us about the power of cloud. And as we start to build new services in the year ahead, how much processing we can augment what happens on the actual robot. Shifting gears a little bit, RoboMaker offers simulation as a service. Gazebo is the most widely used simulation engine for robotics, but our goal is to add every simulator that robot developers want to use. Now, robots are expensive. You don't want to go pushing a software update out there and have them break. They can actually hurt people. They can actually have very bad experiences with the people that are around them or completely erode trust with the customer if the robot quits working because you did an over-the-night software update. Come back to that in just a second. Our service actually allows a developer not to just run one simulation to test their program, but they can run hundreds in parallel because we scale out automatically. We actually will scale how much resources we're giving to a simulation based on the complexity of the simulation. So it's truly elastic, and we only charge the user for exactly what resources they actually use. So surge computing, great workload for the cloud. Well, something else we can do, I can take the very same application, it's my app I'm testing, I can actually create multiple dozens of simulated worlds and make sure my robot works correctly in all these cases, and I can do so in parallel and I can actually get a nice log file that summarizes what simulations had issues, what metrics, power level was drained, collisions were detected, and then I can go, we actually capture the logs for those simulations to see exactly where our program failed. But we had a customer, iRobot, we had, we're giving a very detailed briefing of it here in the agenda, so I hope if you're interested in learning more, you can go find it. They have to test their robot out under all sorts of varying floor conditions. And as they add new robots, they want to be able to test it out under all conditions to make sure. And they want their developers to run agile, make quick changes, check it in, make quick changes, check it in. And at the same time, when they decide to actually do a deployment out into the real world, we want, they want to make sure that there's no regression in performance or no issues. There's actually one called the robot, robot kidnap problem, where somebody could actually come up, pick up the robot, robot thought it knew where it was, it was doing a nice job vacuuming, it knew its path, it knew where it needed to go, and someone picks the robot up, walks across the floor and plops it down somewhere else. And they engineer to make sure this robot will reorient itself and figure out exactly where it is and go about its task. This is a killer problem for them for performance. Um, but it's costly. They were actually testing this themselves with simulation, but then they're also testing it in rooms. Of they had various setups to test this in. It was physical testing. And often they'd find bugs late after it had been deployed. And they saw the value in simulation, so we worked together to actually do large-scale automated testing of simulations every time a developer attempts to check in a code and every time before they actually will push an, a new version of the code out to the robot. It's part of their CI CD system. They had dozens of different rooms and environments that they wanted to test on, and every time they find a new edge case, they can add a new simulation to the suite. They can run all these in parallel. Right now, they have 40 automated tests, which are running for each simulation, all total about 500 automated tests for a release candidate before they allow their application to be pushed out into the real world. And they've gone from three weeks of testing for 70 robot kidnap scenarios that they really care about down to one hour of testing. And it's actually actively catching bugs today and preventing check-ins. So again, an interesting, when you start to appreciate a single developer testing their code with SIM, but now part of your quality control before you actually allow somebody to update. We're gonna be adding more features to make this even easier to implement and to use. Actually, some of you have already been using RoboMaker Simulation, Deep Racer, and here's another use for simulation. Because in Deep Racer, it's reinforcement learning, which is actually training a machine learning agent through trial and error. 
that trial and error is taking place in simulation in AWS RoboMaker. And you're using fleet management as well because once you're satisfied with the performance of your learning agent, and by the way, behind a little more details behind it, yes, there are dozens of simulations. Each one is different. They call that domain randomization because you want the machine learning agent to generalize. Each one's making its own unique mistakes. Those mistakes get aggregated. That training set retrains an ML agent and then they're pushed back down and this process continues until overall performance improves. And then, when you, when you think you've got a good enough trained agent, you go ahead and push that model down to the physical car, sim to real transfer using over-the-air update using fleet management. Um, for those of you who track this, I think the record is getting down to about 6.9 seconds, so you can clearly see this one needs a little bit more training. And it's gonna be exciting to see what happens in the next year because a new version of Deep Racer was announced um, at Midnight Madness last night, which has a LiDAR, has multi-sense depth cameras, all these are new sensor inputs that you're gonna be able to process, simulate, and actually optimize and push out. And by the way, this is a hot area for research and development where reinforcement learning is being used for actuation and mobility of robots as a way of programming, still R&D. But again, an interesting use case that we're gonna be stepping up to support in AWS RoboMaker. We have a number of features in the works that'll be released in, the, in Q1 of next year that'll actually help support this. But this actually has even broader applications. In oil and gas and remote monitoring, you have a device out in the field somewhere, typically a drone, and you can actually build machine learning models with AWS SageMaker using data that you have in the lab. Maybe it's labeled data, it could be photographs, and you can actually test your machine learning model in SageMaker in the lab, and then use our fleet management to do an over-the-air update to push the machine learning model onto the drone. Literally, you can change its mission. You could have a library, and what we have in a demo, we have a robotics layer here in the ARIA. ARIA, correct? Maggie, thank you. In the ARIA, thank you. Um, where you can actually go see some of these in work, and you'll actually see us pushing machine learning models down to a, a Jetson. And the idea is that, yes, the DJA is not running all ROS, but we have ROS code running on it. We have an NVIDIA chip with Greengrass installed, and we can pick from a library of machine learning models and deploy them over the air. We could even change its mission in its entirety, saying, hey, actually, I got a new mission. These robots are all around the country. I can actually test my code in RoboMaker. I can test it in simulation, select the drones that I actually want to train, and actually push the new mission out to them and actually change them. They become resources, edge devices we can program as well. Um, so again, numerous, numerous things we can do with this. So, what excites us, or where we think the role of the cloud is in the future of robotics, just to help you understand before I hand over to Chris. Intelligent cloud services, and there'll be more than what I've just shown you today, can actually enhance the local processing that takes place on the robot. It allows us to keep our robots less expensive hardware. It allows us to enrich and iterate on the services very faster, and so we can improve their performance and their functionality over time and iterate much faster than we can with maybe putting all the processing on a physical robot. Well, we can actually use simulation to actually test correctness of our code and ensure per performance across a range of conditions before we put an application in production. Simulation combined with imitation and reinforcement learning can be used to program robots for navigation and actuation. Again, a very active area for research. I expect to see this over the next several years to become more, more and more mainstream. And what I really didn't hit on too hard here, but in many of the cases where we've worked with customers to set up end-to-end -end apps, where orders are coming in in an order entering system, you don't want to lose that order, you put it in a durable queue, you can then dispatch that task to a robot, you can actually see where the robot is or the inventory is that you want the robot to pick up, that's in a database, you can then send the robot to that location based on what's in the database. You actually see the cloud services help you build end-to-end -end applications where a robot's an important component, but these other cloud services allows you to quickly set up. And if you go to our robotics layer, you'll actually see many demos, and in each case, you'll see the architecture of how we built the whole app, and you'll see the role other services have played to help you build an end-to-end. -end. So again, it doesn't diminish any of the great work that's going on in the physical robot itself, but it helps put it in a broader context of building an application. What I've shared with you of what we've done to date, it is still very much day one for us in robotics. We have a number of new projects coming in FY20. We're gonna to start to add some differentiated services and features um, on top of what I've shown you today, and I look forward to coming back next year and showing you even more. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christopher to take us for the rest of the way.
Can you hear me? I am so proud of you guys. I, I just, I'm in shock. I'm elated. I, uh, I, I maybe even stunted in speech at this moment of time. There is an entire city of people partying right now, having the world's greatest opportunity to make some cash and drink too much and just go all over the place. And you guys are here with me, which tells me you guys actually love technology and robots that much, which makes me just feel like, wow, like some kind of superstar to get up here and hang out with you. But really, at the end of the day, round of applause for you guys, because you're the superstars. Good job on first day AWS, huh? Good job. What do you think? I bet it was a heck of a day, huh? Everybody's going to sleep well tonight? Um, you know, I'm a technology evangelist. I'm a little like, overly amplified about uh, showing you some of the things I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm probably going to go through pretty quickly, but please follow up with me afterwards. Uh, find me on LinkedIn, whatever you want to do. Love to get in conversations, really deep ones at a high level and low level about all the stuff that I'm going to uh, flip through and show you today. So, quote, I start every single presentation with a quote. There is no time for ease and comfort. It's time to dare and endure. Who agrees with me? We're in an ever-evolving society, people. Things are changing. The world is going right out from underneath us. And if we don't keep up with it and race to get to in front of it, you know, we're going to be secondary to the conversation nowadays. So be excited. Holy crap, AWS has blown my mind today. Just to be able to spend this time with these great folks, to spend the time with you, to be able to see some of the things that are taking place. I, I just, uh, I can't stop shaking thinking about it. I just want to go back to the, the, the drawing board and get busy. Um, but I didn't want to leave you guys without a presenter tonight. So stay for one last presentation. So I'm going to focus on a couple of areas where I've paid particular attention that uh, exclusively my R&D department's kind of putting in a high level of emphasis. Retail automation. Who here actually gets your groceries in one hour? Anybody getting grocery delivery? Do you love it? Oh my gosh, I don't even go to the store anymore. It's so cool, man. I, I pick out my items 15 minutes, you know, 20 minutes or you know, later. I'm driving home in that heavy traffic. I show up, the guy's like handing me my groceries, pizza, all that good stuff, and I'm done, you know? And the hardest part is, is when my wife's like, you forgot the milk, and I'm like, hey baby, here's an app, order it, you know, done. Shows up 20 minutes later, right? How, it's hard to forget anything at that point. But really, there's a market here um, in industrial automation, warehouse automation, and manufacturing, and that's in how are our good services food, medications, you know, conversations, everything that's going to take place that take place in the physical world going to uh, get to us. And that's, that's in e-commerce, right? They're going, to, they're going to drive everything. In that, it's not the fact that we're trying to shut down jobs in this world. I'm getting people every day that call me because they can't hire enough labor to accomplish the goals of getting all of you one-hour shoppers satisfied, right? in the way that we're ever growing. And the competition in the cities is steep, right? They want to take the people off the roadways and you know, minimize the amount of traffic to the actual folks that should be delivering to you or bringing goods and services to you and get you out on the foot traffic a little bit more, right? And this is a good way to do it. So I, I think it was over in Europe a couple weeks ago and I was at one of these e-commerce facilities and I was talking to them about their labor. And they said, Chris, do you realize we ship in 75% of our labor from Poland into the Netherlands? And I'm like, you're kidding me. And they're like, yeah, we can't get labor here to work at the airports. We can't get labor to work in commerce. We have to bring labor in, right? And so they're kind of forced, if they want to compete in this world, to bring up automation. So that kind of tells the story of where I'm going to show you some products. Order, pick, dispense, right? It's easy. If you haven't tried it yet, go to one of the major retail outlets and please give it a shot. I'm sure everybody here has tried Amazon, right? Please tell me you've all tried Amazon. <laughs> um, anyway, so it's, it, you know, pick somebody, give it a shot, you'll see how easy it is. And uh, we'll talk about how I give you the technology to make that happen. So 
I love this slide, and I know it's a little dated, but I, I can't walk away from it. Look at the market space. You know, for your autonomous mobile robots, your ASRSs, your AMRs, I mean, my gosh, is there something gonna happen out there or what? And this is going up every single day. That's why I'm hanging out with the Amazon guys. I just wanna tell the story of that and reinforce why I'm here. I can't physically build a team to keep up with what Amazon's already done and what they are doing and so, and, and, and find a slice of that pie. Otherwise, I'm just a hobby roboticist and I'm here to have some fun, make the world's greatest innovations, help everybody, and maybe pay my bills along the way, you know? I don't wanna go bankrupt seven times over, so, you know, it's important that we evaluate these things. So, uh, one of the ways that you accomplish that is you come up with the world's greatest e-commerce autonomous robotic shuttle, right? How cool is that? You stuff a grid as tightly as you can make it happen, right? With different various styles of products, very compacted, right? And then you allow multiple units to drive in there and actually pick the goods before it actually brings them out. So it can pick the entire order while it's inside the grid itself. And then it can come back out and drive those orders to wherever you need to go, right? Thus trying to shut down the amount of traffic that flows through to get orders and goods to services to people. Um, we presented this at Promat. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Promat, but we, we did a debut there. It was a, extremely awesome. What you're kind of seeing here is a demonstration on the simulation side of this, which is very important for you AWS sim folks. And then also the actual reality of the code being enacted out in the real world, right? So two different aspects and ways of looking at it. Conformance, pliability, gripping, end of arm tools that can pretty much pick anything, including bottles of water, right? Conformance, right? So gives you some high degrees of adaptability on any kind of product. So far, I've seen it pick ladies' eye pencils all the way up to basketballs, okay? And, and it doesn't stop there, guys. That's just one way of innovating. You could make the world's biggest and greatest end of arm tools, but that's just another way of looking at it. So, you know, a couple of facts on there. I'm not gonna walk through every single one of them, but you guys can see where we're trying to go here, right? High density grid, flexible workflow, high velocity throughput. You know, and the main market drivers are exactly what I just talked about, ever increasing movement to automate, order fulfillment, right? And existing shuttle systems aren't able to satisfy orders anymore. And you certainly can't get enough people in a back room, you know, to be able to not have them fall over each other. And quite frankly, I'm getting tired of competing with the blue cart guys when I go into a store because they're picking the one hour orders and they're mowing me over while I try to get my groceries. And the stores don't wanna do that to you either. They know better, but they don't have any other solution for right now. These kind of solutions that are autonomous robotic systems will, will help us get there. That's one of many, by the way, just one slice. Another way you can do this is uh, autonomous guided forklifts. That's another amazing, impactful environment is taking some of these units and allowing to work 24 seven, pack vehicles, you know, work in the off cycle, be able to accommodate the, the order throughputs and the high drive times, you know, so that we can actually relevate uh, a lot of opportunities. Now, these are cab vehicles. I attest to you that there will be vehicles that are cabless, right? Because why have a cab? It's unnecessary. So, and it's not because I'm trying to make more godless machines, okay? <laughs> It's actually really because there's a purpose behind all of this in the manufacturing. We will still keep cab machines, but we also wanna go with new cabless designs. Because why have them? They take up space and it's, it's more materials. You don't need to, to build them, obviously. Uh, I don't think this is my creme de la creme, but it's pretty darn close. 10,000 pound machine reaches 30 feet up in the air. We'll pick 3,000 pounds, well, close to 3,000 handle it and uh, yeah it's fully autonomous did I mention that works completely on its own now without good simulation 
good engineering up front, fleet management, and all the services that AWS can provide, surely this thing would knock down all those racks, right? <laughs> and me. And at eight miles an hour, I'd just look like a little speed bump. I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, pretty cool, right? That's a, that's a very unique machine. Absolutely love it. Hard to pick too, by the way, 30 feet up in the air and stabilize, but we figured out how to do it. And again, good simulation is the way that you get there up front. Really, really good simulation. And the second thing is I could not release this into a facility like that without safety in mind. And it has to pass all of the safety derivations necessary to make this happen. Otherwise, it doesn't even walk into that facility. And my man here up front that's with me today, one of my safety masters, worked very, very hard to make sure that this machine would drive just like that. In fact, I think you can see him in back there. I told him, you step in front of the machine when it's driving eight miles an hour. It doesn't kill you. You get to keep your job. <laughs> and lo and behold, he did it. He's a real brave man, I'll tell you what. Pretty cool, right? You know, other ways to solve this is by s systems that actually can uh, move goods and services to and fro into the back of uh, vehicles. And this is one way that we do that. So you start with being able to pack the items and totes, okay, on a system. And this, this is another variation of a system that we built um, that we're currently selling and pushing out to our customers. And it's a basically a goods to service picking opportunity that comes out in a little bit different way. And I'll show you that in just a second. But the idea is, as you pick the order, the complete order of e-commerce, right? And you pack the order as it comes to you. And then I'm gonna show you something even neater to build on that on how we get it out to the truck. Same thing though, you take a compliance end of arm tool and uh, you put it on a vehicle that's capable of driving autonomously anywhere within your facility, right? Pre-map it. And then there is a actual conveyance system where all those totes actually get conveyed off and then moved into another facility where they then get packed, boxed, and moved into a freight line, right? And then there's a very unique way that we do that and move it into the freight line. So this would be a derivation of how we pull it off the tote line, okay? Go through and actually pick these bad boys as you can. Fill up your orders. And then we move to something really, really cool. And that's a truck loader. Once they're in box, right? This actually debuted at uh, Modex and Promat too, for many of you who may have been at those, uh, those uh, events, but they were pretty cool to see in person. They're very, very unique. Another place where simulation, good planning, good engineering, and software for fleet management up front is very, very instrumental. Because this thing's moving thousands of pieces you know, within an hour, so it's very important to be able to go through that process and simulate that up front. And as we all know, that's very, very expensive, right? For you to do yourself, especially when you wanna be elastic and scalable. So, good way to get things on a truck. And I'll show you a little instance of that here. So it takes the boxes in off the conveyance, okay? rounds them about, and actually loads them in the truck, packs them continuously. On the other side of that, they can come back out in the same exact fashion. It goes in and suctions the boxes up onto the long neck of the conveyor, brings them back out, goes off the back end, and back onto a conveyor that then takes them all the way out and allows them to be redistributed back into the facility appropriately or palletized if you will, if you choose to palletize your objects. Very, very popular machine. We had this at, I believe it was Modex in Atlanta, and we had several people offer to write us a check on the spot. 
literally, because it was in the back of a clear 18-wheeler. We put glass up and we show the whole thing and they just said, you know what, back a truck up and they'll take it today. You know, uh, it's a very popular device. But here you can see the other side of it, you know, kind of driving up into the back of a facility and actually throwing boxes in and stock packing. Very cool machine, again, good simulation, good planning, good fleet management. And then that's built on something very, very personal to myself, which is something that I'm extremely emphatic about and I believe in, in the purest sense, so I'm gonna be kind of an evangelist for the moment. But that's speaking about ROS, the robotic operating system. Does anybody in here not know what the robotic operating system is? Has everybody had some familiarity? So a couple of you? Okay. And do we have some folks that really know ROS or understand what ROS stands for or what it does? Okay, so we got a few too. So we got a pretty good mixed audience. Well, it is what it says. It's a distributed framework for process that enables software to be individually designed and loosely coupled at runtime, okay? It's a worldwide phenomenon. It's like Linux for robots, right? Everything we do in this world is a co-collaboration. It's shared, it's proliferated by Microsoft, Intel, Amazon, all the biggest, Toyota, where I come from, right? And we're all working together to make this amazing system. And it affects things like vision, motion planning, perception, navigation, hardware integration, so forth and so on. And many, many other areas that I, are intangibles that I haven't even mentioned. But think of it as a huge coalition of people all writing really premium code together to give everyone the chance to work in robotics. At the smallest of level, for your $200 you know, hobby guys, and at the biggest of level for the grand emporium of all robotics, right? And the largest of the large. And we want to be able to scope this in such a way that where everybody can have access to it, not just educational institutions, but the enterprise and corporate alike. And, you know, it'll very much come into that, you know, uh, livelihood, just like a lot of our early operating systems did that have now became the staple of all of our universes that we live in. So it's simple. A lot of people use it, even the first robotics students. I mean, you got kids that are in eighth and ninth grade building with it. They're writing in C++, Python, and C Sharp. How incredible is that, right? But then you've got guys at Berkeley and Stanford and Columbia all pushing it extremely hard too. You've got the biggest corporations in the world like Amazon, Intel, Microsoft, all contributing, backing it up. And it's all leverageable by you. At any given moment in time, you could go out to the internet right now and put ROS in and start to learn. There's simulations that are there for you. There's code bases. There's a million support systems. You could ask us any question. You could ask a ROS guru or ROS person a question, they'll answer you in 24 hours or less. Because we're that proud of it. We want it to be supported, right? We want people to be happy. It's very powerful. It's scalable. It's elastic and it builds and moves with you. And chances are, if you don't know how to get something done, somebody in your Ross community does. They've probably even put something up there for you to leverage. I use it because it enables easy collaboration, it unifies company development, allows me quick speed to market, right? Low cost point of entry. So if you're wanting to start with some research and land with a product, this is a great way to do it, okay? There's nothing wrong with it. It's got built-in tools, Arviz, Gazebo, a lot of introspection, a lot of development. Perfect place to get involved in robots. If you're not a roboticist today, please start here, okay? Go get a Willow Garage, you know, app, bring something down, go, go to the blog, right? And, you know, find a small, simple robot and start with Ross. Everything you need to, to know and then some will elevate you back in your company and beyond as you're starting to understand more and more about the components of this. This is something that I really enjoy sharing with um, co-collaborative companies 
to help us be co-collaborative. And it helps us all speak the same language. These are just kind of showcases of some implementations of ROS. You know, whether you're trying to uh, make a humanoid, maybe even simulate a humanoid, if you will, or you're working in a manufacturing plant and you want to see how quickly you can actually pull things off the conveyors. That's navigation up in the upper left-hand corner. So that's how we pre-navigate a facility before we actually execute in the real world. So think of the truck that I just showed you that was driving eight miles an hour down a very narrow 10-foot aisle. This is how we figure that out so we don't take people out and racks out and products out, highly valued things, right? Other implementations, pretty cool. Lots of other studies that can be done, right? So mathematically, you can make sure that your systems are correct. So that's where the physics comes in. And I know a lot of you are probably MATLAB users, right? There's a few of those in here so that you can understand your physics models, but that's okay. Arviz and Gazebo got you covered, right? It's not quite as comprehensive, but it's good enough to do the job and it's getting better every day. And with the advent of AWS and other folks investing heavy in it, it's just going to get to become better and better. Um, so it'll be a reliant model. A lot of times we work with a lot of these groups, and I'm focusing in on some areas of vision, robotic arm movement, end of arm tooling, and uh, AI machine learning. I try to push common libraries, joint repositories, and you know, robot behavioral engines. I think those are things that we need to make public for everyone and try to do on as many products as possible. And you'll say, well, Chris, how do you make a profit doing that? Well, the, the, the genius behind that is I'm enabling all of you to not have to call me, right? We're gonna work together on this. We're gonna make a product that's best in class for you for your company, your organization. You're gonna work with other folks like AWS and we're all gonna comprehensively allow you to get your customers as happy as possible and achieve your goals. And by the byproduct of that is we're all gonna sell like crazy, right? Everybody gets a piece of the pie. It's very utilitarian, I know, but it's a dream of mine. I live in a Gene Roddenberry world. I'm hoping to get there and make it all happen with you someday. So let's just transport to the future right now get started here with Ross. The Ross community is uh, obviously made up of a lot of really cool people, right? I don't need to say all the names on there. AWS is on there though, right up top. Toyota's on there. Bastion's on there. Intel's on there. All, all the greatest. Um, they're starting to really, really push hard to try to understand this model and build it to be bigger, greater, and more awesome for everybody. I don't care if you like AI or predictive analytics or data modeling, this, this belongs to you, right? It's comprehensive, it's intellectual, has a huge support base, and you can obviously see there's obviously some people taking it very, very seriously. And I like to say it has 24 seven online presence because somebody somewhere in the world is doing something with Ross and they will answer your question. Even if it's on the other side of the world, you wake up in the morning, there's your answer. You know, somebody's always wanting uh, to, to do the right thing to help you. How does Toyota use ROS? Well, unified standards, standard development, internal rot robotics expertise. We like to have uh, institutional knowledge, right? So that we could make it better, faster, have something that's a little bit more flexible at the end of the day that can be spread across the globe for all of our developers to do, right? Those are very important things. And I, I, I don't think I'm saying anything that's not comprehensive to any technology company. These are all standards that we live by, right? It's the same old doctrine. I'm just re-evangelizing it. I'm trying to baptize you in the raw side of things a little bit, but these are just same principles that we all live by right, every day, but it's, they're good principles to be recognized, and this is where Ross gets you. And then obviously, the comprehensive relationship with Bastion and AWS is incredible, and it, it really goes back to the things that we've all spoke about, but the best thing that I keep hearing over and over and over at this conference is it reduces the snowflake syndrome, okay? It reduces my investment 
that I've got to put back in there so that my engineers can focus on the things that they need to focus on, right? And in the snowflake world, yes, we all want to be individuals, but do we all want to check in individualistic code? <laughs> what a nightmare, right? We'll be crashing all over the place and we'll have a continuous support mission to try to deal with these things, right? And so you need good processes, good institutional knowledge, good fundamentals, good ways to be able to get the things a low cost of support to put your folks on the right activities that you want them to be thinking about, which is innovation, engagement, emerging technologies, and making best in class products for your company, right? Let the big boys that understand how to do things go do stuff for you to help you out. And that's why Toyota and Bastion have felt like this is a very good, unique place for us to hedge our bets. And we're very proud of it. And so I'm not up here kind of prophesizing the future of this whole thing, but I'm telling you, if all of us are kind of heading in that direction, it's a good place for you to be too, and it's very safe. And uh, you know, with anything, you can contact us, right? And Roger and I would personally love to speak to each and every one of you or have a conversation candidly offline and uh, maybe understand where you want to go in the future and what we can do to benefit you and help you or even spirit your leadership into the future in some meaningful way. So please take the survey. I hope you give us uh, fair remarks, and uh, I would like to give you guys a round of applause all together because you stayed here with me during one of the most amazing times possible. Thank you for being here. You rock.